Well, this is the second week of our fall program, and last week we talked about wholeness, and we also talked about how our wholeness is a part of us, and we're going to talk more about that today. And we talked about what wholeness means, and one of the things that we, we found out about wholeness was all of those positive things about ourselves that we have within us, we've always had within us, and we'll never lose. Those things like love and self-worth, those things like confidence and compassion, all of those things that we have that are a part of our wholeness. But somehow, as we talked about last week also, there are also parts of us that are like separate and do not contribute to our wholeness at all. There's those missing pieces that seem to be there that gets us into trouble in our relationships and in many, many other ways. And so this morning I want to talk about uh, our wholeness and, and think about uh, the times when we felt whole and complete. Can you remember those times when you felt whole and complete? I know that I've had those times when I just felt like, you know, everything was perfect and it was in divine order and, and maybe it was just watching a beautiful sunset or, or a newborn child or, or whatever it might have been for you. Sometimes it's like something that we haven't seen before, like the ocean or the mountains and they're, you know, they're, they're awesome. And, and we know that we are a part of all of this. We're not separate from it. We're just a part of it all. And as we feel that, we feel that wholeness within ourselves. And, you know, there are many, many ways to experience wholeness that you don't have to go out of town to do. Um, one of those ways is to experience being centered within yourself. And Shelley took us through that this morning when she brought us into meditation. She centered, you know, we centered ourselves. She had us put our hands on our shoulders so that when we took that nice deep breath, we could feel our shoulders relaxing and, 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 and just, just, it was, you know, and so I felt myself as I did that, that I was like relaxing and it got me into the mood of going into that meditation. And so that's one of those things that we do. When we, are, when we are really searching for wholeness, it's to go within, to become still within ourselves so that we can feel that wholeness in us, so that we can feel it and know it and know that it's, it's who we are and that we can't lose it no matter what happens. When we're not living in our wholeness, we see things as either or, as you will see in our story about the wind and the flag. Well, it seems that there was this wandering monk. And he, as he was walking one day, he walked by a monastery and he heard a lot of other monks who were arguing between themselves. And there was one group of monks who said, the, it, is, it is the flag that moves. And the other group said, no, it's the wind that moves. So they're standing on either side of this flagpole looking and, and they have two different opinions. And as they argue about this, both sides come up with reasons why their, their idea is right and the other one is, is not right. And so back and forth they argued, responding in logic to, of the, you know, responding to the logic of the other side. And, and they, they come up with new rationale for their perspective positions. But it just came down to, it is the flag that moves. It is the wind that moves. After listening for a while to, our, to those, I, those monks, the itinerant monk interrupted them and said, if you will look closely, you will see that it is neither the flag nor the wind that moves. What moves is your mind. What moves is your mind. You see, everything around us we have found in our own minds. What we perceive to be around us is our own minds. And this story is a reminder of how easily we fall into either or thinking. You know, we're doing that um, in our government right now. One side says this is right, and the other side says this is right, and they both want the best 
for our country, and yet at the same time, they can't seem to get together on what it is because it's their minds that are having the problem. It's not one side or the other. And so we want to prove ourselves right. I don't know why that is, but don't we want to do it? Don't we want to prove that our opinion is the right opinion? Always. I know that, you know, I, I got to the point that I wouldn't argue religion anymore because I knew I was right. No. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, they're all right. They're all right for each of us in our own selves. You know, interrupting our ingrained reactions to things allows us to consciously create new reactions that better reflect our current stage of development. Being an observer, watching what we say, and determining if it is something that we have said because it's something we've always believed, or if it's something that we said that just came out of old programming that we have had. Old things that we have said over and over again. I can remember saying to someone once, well, this is how I am and I probably won't change. I was wrong. And I have to admit it. And so, um, when, we, when we have a thought that we're not really sure of, ask yourself consciously, is this really what I want to think? Is this really what I want to, to say? Or do I need to think a moment and think about what it is I really want to say or think? And then we ask ourselves, what thought do I choose to think? What thought is it that I choose? And you will find in many, many times that it will be very different from the thought you were originally thought. You'll find it's really quite different if you take a moment just to look. This is a very, very practical exercise that works as well with habitual emotions and memories as it does with thoughts. And so when you find yourself sliding into those old places where you don't really want to be, but they do feel very familiar, Take a moment and, th and say to yourself, is this really how I want to feel? Is this really how, what I want to remember? Or do I want to remember something else? Zen stories have a way of serving us as intriguing reminders that we can use to keep our feet on the path of a calm heart and an untroubled mind. And so that's why I tell stories. I tell stories because we are going to remember them more than we are going to remember the ideas that I tell you. And this takes me to my next story. When evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they left the crowd behind and they took him along in a boat just as he was. And there were also other boats with him. And a wild storm came up, and waves crashed over the boat, and it was about to sink, and Jesus was in the back, sleeping on a cushion. And Jesus and the disciples woke him up, and he said, and they said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, and he ordered the wind to stop, and he said to the waves, Peace, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith at all yet? Well, I thought about that. Don't you have any faith at all yet? And I think what he was saying to them was, I think he was saying, What has happened to your wholeness? Do you not know who you are? Do you not know that you can do these things that I do? But the circumstances had taken them from center. And I believe that he was saying that they still hadn't realized their wholeness. 
And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. The Christ, the divine spirit, our higher self, Jesus in each one of us is the eye or the calm of the storm. For we are all these things. We are the places in our life, we are at the places in our life where we need to say, peace, be still. Peace, be still. And often we are in that place and we forget. We forget. We get caught up in the storm. And we forget to say, peace, be still. In our book that we're studying this month, there's a story, and I, for this week, six week program, it's, it's, by the way, I don't think the book says so, but I believe that this is a true story that takes place in Southern California some time ago, because I've heard this story before. And uh, it's certainly an interesting one, and it illustrates so well how we can get caught up in a storm of our own making. So I, I, I uh, want to tell you about Reverend Tom, who was a minister at a large church. And he became suspicious of his board president uh, when he heard that they had scheduled a board meeting when he was out of town. And uh, that's always a scary thing for a minister, let me tell you. Um, he became more suspicious as time went on because he heard that this... this um, uh, well, he knew that his board president had had just not scheduled, had not shown up for a regular routine meeting that they always had, and and so he was he was a little concerned about that. That you know he didn't get any real advance notice just right you know just just prior to he got the notice, and so she had canceled on him, and and later he he, he discovered that she'd been snooping around his office after hours. Well, what are you going to think about that? You know? And so, so he began to uh, piece together other events and, and, um, and conversations that he had overheard. And, and he felt that surely his job was in jeopardy, that they were going to let him go and they were going to demand him to, re to resign. And at the end of the week, he had got a call from the treasurer and the treasurer informed him of a special meeting of the board after Sunday service. Well, that was it. He was absolutely certain then that something was going on, and, and he, he, was, he was worried, worried and concerned. And um, when he asked what the meeting was about, he was only told that it would be brief and to the point. <laughs> So Tom found, found little comfort in the applause that his congregation gave him after the, after the sermon, and uh, he had entitled that sermon, Believing in Yourself. <laughs> in, receiving, in the receiving line, the thought, uh, he thought that he um, wouldn't leave without a fight, that he wasn't going out easy. And so Tom entered the boardroom and was very nervous, was extremely nervous. And the president asked him if he would, you know, begin the meeting with prayer. And um, when it was over, uh, Sally, the board president, began by apologizing to Tom for the board's not being more open in its deliberations. But she said that uh, given the circumstances, they had to conduct their business in executive session. Tom steeled himself. And so she continued with recognizing Tom's accomplishments and the ways that he had blessed so very many in the congregation and the extent that he would be missed if circumstances were to cause him to leave the church. Tom braced himself and he thought surely this was it. Sally looked at her fellow board members 
And then she looked at Tom. And she announced to Tom the board's unanimous decision to recommend to the membership that the church purchase a luxury home for their minister in appreciation of his many years of dedication and dedicated service to the church. The home was to be gifted to him personally. Tom sank speechless into his chair. <laughs> and tears filled his eyes. And his only consolation in the midst of overwhelming embarrassment was that he had not given in to the urge to rally supporters and campaign in a campaign of ousting his mutinous board. <laughs> <coughs> Have you ever had an experience like Tom's where you took something and you started to run with it in your mind? And you started to, you know, put things together that you knew added up to something. And when you did this, you, you've just, you kept adding things and adding things. And maybe sometimes this goes on for years in your life. Perhaps it's with a family member or perhaps it's with a friend. And eventually, you know, it all just kind of blows up. But we don't have to do that. Notice when you're making up things in your head. Because we all do that. We take circumstances and, you know, often we think that we're mind readers. And we take those things and we blow them up and they become something that they're not. But who, who is making this storm? Who is making this storm? It is the eye. But in the eye of the storm, we are calm. We are peaceful. We think that anything that happens is going to turn out to be good for us. You know, if he had been asked for his re resignation, chances are something even more wonderful would have come up for him. But that wasn't the case at all. He made it all up. And so we need to learn that when we start going down that trip, down that road, that it's time to rein in and say, wait a minute, I don't have all of the facts here. And I know that whatever is happening, that it is for my best, for my good. Don't let your mind trick you anymore. And so, we, we talk about in this chapter enemies and that sometimes we actually do have some enemies, but they don't mean what we think they mean. And so there are four steps that we can use to deal with our enemy. And the first is in the presence of the enemy, love. It is important that we always love no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how hard it is. We love. And think of that person or the situation as a mirror that is in front of you in order for you to, to connect with your wholeness. Because if you see that, mirrors are there because, because we, um, we can't always see what's going on within our own hearts and minds. Those of you who were in the fall program did a, a, an exercise this week in which you, you named people and the things, the, the positive traits that you got from those people. And, and at the end you were told, you know the only reason you could see those traits is because you have them in you. Well, it's the same thing with negative traits. It goes both ways. And so if you're seeing something in another person, bring it back to yourself and say, where in my life am I, am I doing something like that? Where is it? And, and know that if we see that, we are just not in our wholeness. Because if we were in our wholeness, then we wouldn't see that at all. Look closely, but not out there, but in here. Number three, work for the good in the situation. And that way you're working as God is working. 
Doing good means doing the right thing. We all know when we're doing the right thing. We can feel it. We often rationalize it, try to make it something else because we think it's going to hurt us if we're actually truthful with ourselves. And yet, what's going to hurt us is not being aware. Not being aware. And number four, the next thing you do with a perceived enemy is pray. This is so important. Pray. Pray for those who spitefully use you or persecute you. And see this as a case in which the relationship or the situation is not against you. It is for you. See that. It is for you. It is for your information. It is for you. And see this as a case in which the relationship or the situation is not against you. It is for you. And it is there as a gift for you. Inviting you to embrace your wholeness and your worth. And so these things are important for us to remember. They're important for us to remember as we go through our life. So that when we feel these feelings of upset around us. Or we think we have an enemy. Use that to help you discover your wholeness. And now, if you will look in your bulletin, you will see two orange strips of paper. This. Take the long one. Notice it has a place to write your name. And it's also on the wall. And let's affirm it together. Together. I, Barbara, stand serene at peace in the eye of the storm. Write your name in the space indicated and pass it to the center aisle right here. And the ushers will come and pick them up. Once there was a king who offered a prize to the artist who could paint the most peaceful picture. Many artists tried, and the king looked at all of the pictures. He looked at every one of them. One picture was of a calm lake. It was beautiful and serene. There were mountains all around reflected in the lake, and it was beautiful and calm and peaceful. And all who saw this picture thought it was the perfect picture of peace. The other picture had mountains too, but they were craggy and rugged and bare. And there was rain falling from a dark, overcast sky. And there was lightning playing in that and coming in off of the mountainside was a waterfall that was foaming and frothy. This did not look peaceful at all. But when the king looked closely, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. In the bush, a mother bird had built her nest. There, in the midst of the rush of angry water, sat the mother bird on her nest in perfect peace. Which picture do you think won the prize? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Somebody knows this story. <laughs> the king chose the second picture. And do you know why? Because, explained the king, peace does not mean to be in a it does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hardship. Peace means to be in the midst of all of these things and still be calm in your heart. And that is the meaning of peace. So every morning I invite you to stand in front of your mirror and say, I stand serene 
at peace in the eye of the storm. God bless you and thank you.